Welcome into the program. Great to be with you. Tactics Radio is on live right now, and we have quite a bit of news to get to, so thank you for being with me on this Thursday. Quick programming note before we begin, I will not be here on Monday. I'm going to probably wind up uh, doing jury duty, maybe doing it for a while, who knows, maybe maybe because of, of whatever reason I wind up getting disqualified and it, it only lasts a day. For all I know, I could be out for a week. You know, you just, you never know with these kind of things. So we will try to keep you updated. And I assume that I'll be able to get on social media, even being up there. So I'll try to send out some updates via Twitter, by the way, at tactics radio, if you want to follow me, but you know, we don't know. I will let you know when I know, but right now I don't. So I can't. And speaking of stuff going on locally, besides me serving in Elmore County, because of course that is where I'm from, there is some local news going on right now as far as state lawmakers go. Now, this to me is shaping up to be a intriguing conference, because what is going to happen is our Congress is about to be in session again. And with that comes ideas you know, differing opinions, whatever you want to call it, there is going to be a conflict of priorities and there's also going to be a conflict of how to make those priorities come about. In other words, come to fruition. And considering the, I would say, fairly substantial amount of business that went unfinished in the last congressional session in the state of Alabama, I I think we're going to see if they've decided it's time to move on to different things or if our lawmakers are going to try to resume, essentially make this a continuation of the last session or somewhere in between to where they bring up some old business, but they also want to focus on some new ideas, some new things that they have not brought up previously. So Republicans and Democrats, according to some uh, fine reporting by our news partners over at WSFA, they have said essentially that it seems as though there actually is, surprisingly, some agreement between Republicans and Democrats in the House of Representatives and the Senate for the state of Alabama as to what needs to be done. There is a bit of disagreement on how to accomplish it, which really should come as no surprise to anybody. So the Speaker of the House, Matt McCutcheon, said in an interview the other day on the gas tax, we've waited long enough. What revenue streams we had created and addressed in 1992, and we haven't done anything since from the state's perspective. Now, my initial reaction to this whole thing is that once again, you have people that ran as Republicans that campaigned on the idea of small government, small taxes, yet again seeming to make their priority taxing us yet again. So Republicans that are supposed to be fiscally conservative and try to cut waste and all these other things, it seems as though their priority, the first thing that this new Congress is going to do, and there are several new representatives, freshman representatives in the House and Senate, that their priority number one is to come up with a way to raise taxes on the citizens of Alabama. It's incredibly disappointing, and here's the thing. I understand that government needs revenue to function. I understand that the only way to do that is through taxation. I'm fine with that. I've made my peace with that. I don't necessarily like it, but like Ben Franklin said, the only thing that is unavoidable is death and taxes, and there's a lot of truth and a lot of wisdom in that statement as so many things that Franklin said uh, would, would kind of go along with that. But When we're looking at taxation and we're looking at the way that this becomes priority one, this is the first thing that they want to do, they seem gung-ho about it, It, this happens just about seemingly every time we get new lawmakers in office, be it a governor like Robert Bentley who promised no new taxes, basically had the George H.W. Bush moment, no new taxes, and then as soon as he got elected, you know what, new taxes, new taxes are, it's time for new taxes. And this is the problem that I have with lawmakers, because I don't think McCutcheon is necessarily a terrible guy, but you're looking at the numbers, and this is the case they're making to us, that you're looking at the numbers, and the money that we've pledged to spend is not equal to the money that we're taking in, in other words, our revenue sources. Well, here's the thing about that. There is so much waste going on in the House and the Senate. The budget for the state of Alabama 
it's just so bloated and so overdone. And part of that is because we were run by Democrats for over 130 years, and I get that. But the problem with coming to the American taxpayer and saying, we need more of your money, is that when you know that bloat is there, when you know that ridiculous, exorbitant level of government is there, and I get that we're, we're fortunate in the state of Alabama to ha not have one of the larger and more intrusive state governments, but still, when you know that waste is there, when you know there is room to cut more, and you're coming to me with your handout saying, we need more of your money, especially when the vast majority of you ran on the platform of we're not going to need any more of your money, this is where I get a little irritated. You need to cut into the budget. Cut into it, find money that is already there, that is already being spent and wasted on some of the frivolous things that this state does. And then, once you've looked at it and cut and 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 looked at it again and cut and there is nothing left. You have cut the budget down to its bare bones, only the absolute essential functions of government then come to me and say, you know what? We did the best we could. Still no money. Raising taxes should not be your first resort. It should be your last resort. Cutting taxes should be something that you do, or sorry, uh, increasing taxes should be something that you do at the end of a congressional session and only after you have spent that entire congressional session trying to figure out every conceivable way under the sun to, spit, to eliminate programs that we do not need. Because when the, and I'm not trying to denigrate our lawmakers because I think we have some fine lawmakers in the state of Alabama as well, but I'm saying let, let's talk about principles, let's not make it personal. What they are doing is essentially like a spoiled rich heiress who spends an awful lot of daddy's money because it's not hers and she doesn't have a real appreciation for the value of a dollar. Again, I'm not talking about any one specific lawmaker, I'm talking about the body as a whole that already has a lot and already waste a lot, still coming back to the house for another handout. Look, I absolutely understand the need to fund government. And even though I tend to be a little bit more libertarian, I'm okay with spending a, a certain amount on taxes if it means we get a certain return, a certain level of service from that. But what I'm saying is we are involved with so many programs right now that it makes no sense that we're funding them. And we're hemorrhaging money and we've got politicians that are saying that we need to even be spending more money. And I know because I've talked to them, I've interviewed them. If you're not going to be willing to cut what is already there and take a look at the waste that is already there and shave it off, and then if you still need money, then come back to me, okay, I'm open to hearing your proposal. At that point, if you say, look, we, we cut everything we possibly could, and here's the list of things that we've cut to prove it, we're saving money as much as we can, but we still need more. All right, at that point, I'm open to hearing your proposal. But if you're looking at the way that the sausage is made and you're looking at all of the various things that the state of Alabama is currently involved in, it becomes very clear to me that you have not even come close to doing everything that you can to ensure that the taxpayer money that you already get sent to you is being spent wisely, so why would I then reward you by sending more money your way? If you want more of the taxpayer's dollar, I get it. If that's absolutely essential for the functions of government, I understand, but only after you've already looked at the budget and slashed as much as humanly possible, then we can talk about new taxes. And one other thing that was brought up is that the Democrats have suggested that instead of raising taxes, and again, it blows my mind that the Republicans are saying, you know what, we need new taxes. And the Democrats are saying, no, 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 we can, we can fund it other ways. Now, I don't agree with the ways that the Democrats are offering to fund it, but I'm just saying on the, the bare surface, check out the irony here that it's Alabama Republicans that are saying we got to raise taxes. It's Alabama Democrats that are saying, no, nah, we can fund it other ways. I don't agree with the method they're using. I'm just saying that there is a, a healthy dollop of irony sitting atop that particular pastry. And so the Democrats, their proposal is to favor a lottery. Now, here's the thing about the lottery. 
And I know that this is a contentious issue in the state because we are very strict compared to other states when it comes to things like gambling. And I understand that. But let's just talk about the lottery itself. I don't have a problem with a person from a libertarian standpoint spending their money however they want to. If it means they ruin their life by getting addicted to gambling, as horrible as that is, and as much as I want to reach out to that person as an individual and help them, I don't think that it is the government's responsibility to keep you from doing stupid things. I understand that it's the government's responsibility to keep you from bearing the consequences of other people's stupid actions. For example, robbery or driving 150 miles down the, the highway. Like the, It is the government's responsibility to protect you from the dumb actions of others. But as far as your own choices, the things that you yourself decide, that one, it's not really the government's responsibility to protect you from. If you want to make a mistake, that's your business. And so from a libertarian standpoint, I totally understand the argument that we should be allowing gambling to take place if it's a free exchange of money, even though it's a very one-sided exchange of money, but it's a free exchange of money between individuals. But what I don't understand is the idea that the government act ought to be actually running gambling. You see the difference there? For example, being kind of a libertarian-minded guy myself, I tend to think that it's a bad idea for the government to be involved in marriage. That doesn't make me anti-marriage. It means that I think their role in it ought to not be there. And it's the same thing with gambling. I don't necessarily see the benefit and why it is the government's responsibility to protect people from their own vices in the form of gambling. However, when it comes to the lottery, even though I wouldn't necessarily mind a private company running a lottery, I don't necessarily think that it's a good idea for the government itself to be running a lottery. And this is the, the thing that I have an issue with. If somebody could make a, a fairly compelling case for a, a allowing the lottery and allowing that to take place with a private entity... Okay, then I'm a little bit more open to the idea, but the way that the Democrats are proposing this, that the government actually runs a state lottery, be it an education lottery or, or whatever else, that I'm having a much harder time sort of grabbing onto that idea because that's just another excuse to grow government and have them involved in another sector, which they should not be. Private entities, okay, but you're going to have a really hard time convincing me that the state of Alabama as a government ought to be running and facilitating a lottery. And whether or not you agree with it on a moral basis, I don't think that you can make the case from a moral perspective or a legal perspective or a practical perspective that the state running a lottery is a good idea, at least not to me. Uh, another thing that they have mentioned that both parties want to fix the prison system. This is a noble cause, and it is something that really does need to be addressed because for the past several years, in fact, as long as I've been doing this, as long as I've been doing radio, I can remember that there are issues with the prison system, that there are prisoners that are just, I mean, absolutely stuffed in there like corkwood, and we're running out of room, we're trying to figure out a way to build new prisons, and there is a difference of opinion on how to deal with this. From the Republican and Democrat standpoint, the Republicans have essentially vowed to look into funding increases for the courts. And this makes sense because if you have a robust court system, and, and there are some courts that actually do need money in the state of Alabama, and that is a legitimate form of, of government, that's a responsibility that they actually do bear. So the court system and, and funding it adequately, I understand from that perspective the need to look into increasing funds going to that particular entity. And I think that that actually would help if you're expediting cases, if you're able to look at things quicker, you're able to expedite cases where we're considering prisoners for things like parole and being able to let them out of the prison. That actually, I think, is something that is going to at least assist, not solve the problem per se, but at least assist in the issue that we're having of overcrowded prisons. The Democrats have essentially suggested that they'd rather look at it from the angle of prison reform. And I know this is going to surprise some people, but I don't think that's necessarily a terrible proposal. I don't think that's a bad idea. In fact, I think that on this particular issue, there is a middle ground here that can and probably should be met. Because I think that funding the courts adequately and looking at prison reform and looking at you know maybe getting rid of some mandatory minimums, that kind of thing... 
that actually I think is is not a bad place to to meet in the middle. This is one area where I think compromise is actually something that could be beneficial and we could come up with a better plan having both sides work together than we would with them apart. There, there are several issues where I don't think that's the case. That there's so much discrepancy and, and some of the ideas coming out of one side are so bad that you need to not compromise, you need to hold the line. But on this, I think that there is some level of give on both sides where you could probably meet that happy medium. Because the government was never designed, or at least imagined, in such a way by the founders. And I know I'm dealing with state law instead of federal law, but follow me on this. The founders had a vision of a country to where the laws were so incredibly minimal and the government had so little involvement in your life that the average citizen was not a lawbreaker. And it would actually require an extreme recklessness or a negligence towards the well-being of another to be considered a lawbreaker. They never imagined a country that we were living in some kind of surveillance state where there's cameras everywhere and they never imagined a country where just the average person living about his life, that there were so many laws and they were so convoluted and, and self-contradictory that just the average citizen not intending to break the law at all and with the best of intentions could accidentally mess up and break the law. And so I think that unfortunately, and I'm not saying this about the, well, well to a degree, I think there are some regulations and laws in the state of Alabama that are ridiculous and stupid and, and we have a very bloated constitution that we've gotten to the point to where when we're looking at criminal law, there is far too low a threshold to become, quote unquote, a lawbreaker. Now, a lot of those things that I'm talking about, the nonviolent offenses, those are not things that went, that land you in prison per se. But I'm just saying that we do need to take, I think, a serious look and review and and take a step back and say, all right, maybe this was a good idea at the time. Maybe it wasn't. But nonetheless, we got to look at it from the context of today, and is it really beneficial for the state to be cracking down on this particular offense? And so I know I'm talking in generalities here, but there's so many little details that getting into the, the weeds here I think is, is unproductive. And I'll try to, as the issues come up, get a little bit more specific on that. But on this particular issue, I think that it's actually wise to take the standpoint of we should make it to where – if you break the law, if you violate the rights of another individual, another human being, then we're going to come down on you. But as far as the intent behind it, we should be actively encouraging people to not be lawbreakers and to make it actually put a pretty high threshold on that, I guess would be the way to say that. I want to get crime off the streets as much as possible too. And when you have criminals, you got to deal with them. And I get that. But I do think that the prison reform system is, or the prison reform proposal by the Democrats, I want to see the details. I want to see actually how they're proposing that we do this. I'm not just going to rubber stamp it and say it's a good idea regardless of what it is. But I think at least the, the overall intent is probably coming from a good place here. So it's going to be an interesting session with the new Congress. And I am really looking forward to seeing exactly how that unfolds, how that plays out. So a couple of things that we want to talk about here. You remember that we were going through the president's address the other day and, and some issues that went along with that. There's a couple of things that I wanted to present that I didn't get a chance to the other day. And, and the reason that I, I do is because I think especially now that we're 24 hours removed from that, then we can get a better look back at exactly what it did and how this is going to play out. Um, the truth is, I think there is a substantial amount of apathy throughout the country on this particular issue. Not saying that it's a good thing, not saying I approve of it. I wish people were more informed, more passionate about this issue. But overall, I think there's a substantial amount of apathy about the shutdown and unfortunately about the border as well. Now, those of us that are political geeks that eat, uh, eat and breathe this stuff every single day like me, like probably a lot of you are if you're watching my show – that's something that's hard for us to understand, but we have to accept the fact that there is a, a, a fairly significant amount of complacency when it comes to the border. And they don't see it as necessarily something to get all up in arms about and to shut down the government. However, the interesting thing about all this is there's a fair amount of apathy about the shutdown as well. And when you're talking about the border – Unless you're a political nerd or 
you are somebody that actually lives on the border and feels the direct effects of loose border laws in a very direct and personal way, typically you're not super informed on that issue. But when it comes to the shutdown, there are very few people, except for federal employees, who tend to vote overwhelmingly Democrat anyway, that are really up in arms about the shutdown either. And the longer it goes on, the more people are realizing, yeah, the government being shut down really isn't that big a deal. It's really not affecting my life in any personal way. There's not a sense of panic. I'm not freaking out about this whole thing. And so there's a lot of apathy when it comes to the shutdown, and that apathy actually grows the longer that the shutdown goes on, because the longer it goes on, people are like, huh, it's really not that bad. It's kind of like when you get into a shower and you're anticipating the water being very hot, and so immediately your reaction is, you know, stay away from the water a little bit. You may back up a little. And over time, it just kind of gets to where it's it's not really feeling all that hot to you anymore. Your body adjusts itself to that environment. And so that's what we're seeing here is that people, even people that were afraid of the government shutdown and were freaking out about it, once they realize that the federal government really doesn't have a very vital role to play in their day-to-day -day life, they started to realize, yeah, the government shutdown really isn't nearly as bad as I thought it was. And that also means that it paints the politicians that caused it, Republican and Democrat alike, as not necessarily being nearly as uh, careless as they thought it was because the consequence of them not funding the government isn't as bad as they originally thought. Now, again, I think that the government does need to reopen. I'm hoping that that happens soon, but I do think that this fight is absolutely worth having and worth shutting down the government for a few weeks for, and I don't think that the fallout on that has been terrible when it comes to that. And actually what you're looking at and what we're seeing from a political standpoint is the theory that I just proposed, that the longer it goes on, the less upset people are about the shutdown and the more people see, yeah, maybe this fight was worth having, that actually is playing out in real time when it comes to the numbers. So, ex for example, uh, if you're looking at this, the stats show that Trump is actually, oddly enough, winning the fight when it comes to the shutdown, because the longer the shutdown goes, the less people blame him for it. So on December 17th, there was a poll that showed 54% of Americans blamed the president for the shutdown yesterday it was only 49%. That's a six-point drop. Sorry, a five-point drop. So you're looking at the majority of, of Republicans by a decent margin, not a huge margin, but a decent uh, margin, saying, yep, Trump's to blame for the shutdown. He's the one that screwed up. He's the one that's responsible for this. He's the one that's being unreasonable. And so he's the reason for the shutdown. That's starting to drop to where actually less than half of Americans blame the president for the shutdown now. And then that same poll that I was talking about on December 17th, so right around the beginning of this shutdown talk uh, taking place, you had 24% of the people actually blame Democrats, while 33% did yesterday. See, now that's a, a substantial increase. That's a nine-point increase, which anytime you're nearing the 10% mark, that's really significant in politics. And so what we're seeing here is a decreasing in the amount of Americans that blame President Donald Trump for the shutdown and an increase of people that are starting to blame the Democrats. And the longer this goes on, the more that trend seems to work itself out. And now the president is down, of course, today on the border making that case and, and doing so with the cameras. I think that that actually may move the needle a little bit more in his favor. The address last night I don't think is going to move the needle that much. The only thing that I may be sort of underestimating is that even though there was no new information when it came to either the president's address or the rebuttal, it was, it was not stuff any of us hadn't heard before. Yet we've never heard it because we're paying – or we've heard it before because we're paying attention. You may be dealing with some people that because it was a primetime address, even though they've not been keeping up with the issue, may not have even known that the government was shut down, that they saw that address last night – and that it perked their ears up and they paid attention because it was something that was happening in prime time. Now, that was certainly true back in the day when you only had a few TV stations. I don't think that that's necessarily nearly as impactful now as it was back then. But nonetheless, there are probably some people that the stats that the president gave, that's the first time that they've heard that information. It's the first time they've heard how bad it is 
on the border and how many murders and sexual assaults and violent crimes have been committed by illegals. And so because of that, because this is new information to them, this is something that they had not anticipated previously, I think at that point you may have some people that are like, maybe the president isn't being nearly as unreasonable as I originally thought. And so maybe that moves the needle a little bit in his favor because the exchange last night, I do think that he actually wound up winning it. I thought that uh, uh, Senator Schumer and, and Representative Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi now, were they just came off as it being all feelings based and they tried to make emotional appeals, but it didn't really work out. And it was it was more. It's funny that Chuck Schumer accused the president of a temper tantrum. But if you were watching it just last night, again, I'm trying to take myself out of the the mindset of a political analyst for a second and just Joe Blow, who happens to be watching primetime TV and sees the presidential address on and watches it. I got to tell you, if I'm coming in as an outside observer that hasn't really been following it and looking at the two and trying to figure out which one looked angry and which one looked calm and rational, I have to give that one to the president. He had his fa facts, he had his figures, and he did offer a little bit of an emotional appeal, but he didn't do so with malice or anger. Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, they got a little hot under the collar at least a couple of times in their address. They appeared calm for the most part, but if you're asking who was sing slinging the personal insults, that would be Pelosi and Schumer. In fact, even though that there was sort of a backhanded moment where Trump did address Nancy Pelosi and said that there have been some that have referred to the wall as immoral. That could also be viewed as just people that are saying the wall is immoral. Nancy Pelosi isn't the first person to say that. In fact, it was kind of a long time before she jumped on that bandwagon and actually said that the wall itself was immoral. And so again, if you're somebody that's been keeping up with this closely, you know exactly what he was talking about and that Nancy Pelosi did make that statement the other day. But if you're just a regular person that doesn't really pay a whole lot of attention to the news, but happen to see that presidential address, you don't know that. And so because of that, it seems as though the president is the one being more rational and Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, they looked more like the ones that were throwing a temper tantrum or were keeping the, the thing closed because of their own, uh, their own desire to not fund the border wall, which seems unreasonable. And speaking of that, this morning, you had the president in a meeting, and Nancy Pelosi and he had a back and forth, and even though I think this was stupid, I would have advised the president not to take this deal, even if she offered it. The president, very plainly, and I think this was a brilliant move on his part, he said, essentially, okay, Nancy, and I'm paraphrasing here, I get that you want the border open, but I also want a border wall. And what Chuck Schumer was saying the other night is let's separate the border wall from the issue of the budget. That being said, if I give you what you want and reopen the government in the next 30 days, will you look at doing something with the wall? And she just plainly said no. See, that's what's so hilarious to me about this. They're always trying to portray the Republicans as the ones that are digging in their heels and not willing to budge. The Republicans have offered several different proposals at this point. You had the original five billion. You have the uh, one point or sorry, the um, was it one point six, one point six billion offer. You had the one billion offer. Um, you had the offer by the president, which laid out a plan, very detailed, five point seven billion dollars for the wall, and actually changed the nature of the wall because the the Democrats had a problem with the price tag and and there was some reasonable uh logic behind that actually of how the wall was going to work and what the wall was actually going to be and so the steel wall instead of the concrete wall was was something that the president was going to be a little bit more flexible on the democrat stance at the beginning of this thing is no funding for a wall the democrat stance now is no funding for a wall every proposal that they've had is let's just do business as usual let's just uh, go ahead and pass this continuing resolution and no no, no, no new funding for a wall. And so I actually wish that the Republicans were a little more staunch on this. I wish that they were a little more inflexible on this, but the truth is they've been incredibly flexible on this and proposed several different methods and several different proposals and budgets 
that would fund the wall and fund the rest of the government as well. And the Democrats have repeatedly said, nope, not going to give any money whatsoever for a wall. Nancy Pelosi joking the other day, I'm only going to give $1 for the wall. And so again, if I'm not a political analyst, if I'm just trying to dip my toe in the water here and take a look at what the Democrats are doing, because I don't know this particular news story interests me or something, I'm looking at the Democrats saying that we're not going to budge, and I'm seeing the Republicans proposing several different bills to try to to try to satisfy the Democrats, and them repeatedly saying, "Nope, nope, 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 not going to do it, not going to do it, not going to do it, not going to do it." Well, then the Democrats, especially for someone that's not super informed on this issue, they come off as the ones that have just not budged and, and been completely unreasonable. And unfortunately, I think even if you are <laughs> informed on the issue at this point, they still come off as the ones that are being completely unreasonable. And so this, uh, this blame, blame, uh, blame game is completely worthless. Both sides are shutting down the government. That's the way that it works in our system. You need uh, approval by the House, the Senate, and the President to go ahead and pass a budget, and so any failing on any of the three branches in that part. So unless you have one party with a majority in the House, a supermajority in the Senate, and the President, you can't blame just one party for the government shutdown. It absolutely takes both, unless you have all three of those factors in place. So there's also a counterpoint to uh, to be offered here that I've seen this going around the internet. I've seen it going around several of the uh, sort of the liberal sites, you know, MSNBC, Vox.com, Huffington Post, that kind of thing. I, I'm not saying that I'm not using those specifically. I'm just saying I'm trying to remember. I think Axios did something on this as well. But so the counterpoint that is being presented here is that, well, citizens kill more people than illegals. And I was just doing some number crunching the other night to do some research on this. And if you're talking about in raw numbers, because this is, remember, one of the sticking points that President Trump presented as part of his reason that there is a humanitarian crisis going on at the border and something needs to be done about it and a wall will be a big help in sort of preventing some of those things. And so one of the dumbest counter arguments that I heard out of this was, well, yeah, he's saying that there are all these crimes and all these murders that are committed by illegals, but they're still killing less people than American citizens. In fact, we have American citizens that are killing people more so than all of the illegal immigrants combined. Well, if you're talking about raw numbers, that's actually true. So, for example, if you're looking at the total of FBI crime statistics and looking at the murders that have been committed, and by the way, even the left-leaning fact-checkers like PolitiFact and that kind of thing did affirm that the figures that the president was using were largely accurate. They took some issue with a few other things, but as far as the numbers that he was using, they actually said that those were, were pretty much spot on based on the resources that they looked at. And I'm talking about PolitiFact, Washington Post fact-checker, all of the usual suspects, the usual fact-checking sources. So on this particular point, in raw numbers, they are right that citizens do kill more people than illegals. For example, um, if you're taking the FBI crime statistics total and then subtracting that, because remember the number that the president used was 4,000 murders in two years. So if you're going to look at the data here, we have to remove that 4,000 from the equation because they get counted as murders regardless of whether they were murdered by either citizens or illegals. So let's look at the total number that were killed according to the FBI. Take that 4,000 out of it over the span of two years. Well, if you're looking at that and that's how you work it out, that leaves you with 18,910 according to the 2015 FBI crime stats, which by the way, Murder has actually been on a steady decline since the 90s, and so while the number is probably pretty close, 2015, which is the most recent year that I was able to find, 2015 is actually probably a little bit higher than it is today because we've been on a steady decline for a very long time. And so actually, we're using numbers that are probably a little higher than they ought to be for citizen committed crimes, but nonetheless, let's just run with that for the time being. 
And this is what I say whenever I do stats like this. I say, every time you do this, always give the other side the benefit of the doubt as often as you can. So they can't say that you're being biased or you're skewing the numbers. So even though the actual numbers are probably a little lower than this when it comes to murder rate by citizens now, because these are three-year-old stats, let's just use the inflated stats for the time being and make that assumption give them every advantage when it comes to this. So in raw numbers, it's true, 18,910 is substantially more than 4,000. I mean, it's more than four times what you're looking at when you're talking about the murders committed by illegal aliens. However, why don't we adjust for population? Let's adjust for population on this because we're not looking at how many murders are committed per se. We're looking at the murder rate. We're looking at how likely you are if you're an illegal versus an American citizen to commit an act of murder. So the citizen murder rate, if you're calculating this per 100,000, would be 5.91 per 100,000. So that's the ones committed by American citizens. If you're looking at that and you're using these stats that even the left agrees are correct, that would make the illegal murder rate 33.06. 33.06 as opposed to the 5.91 per 100,000 by American citizens. That's over six times, almost seven times the murder rate for a regular citizen. So this idea that illegals are not committing murders at a rate comparable to that of an American citizen is just hogwash. It's not even close. And again, this is not to say that all illegal immigrants are murderers because we're talking about 33% or we're talking about 33 out of 100,000. That's a pretty small number, but it's a lot higher than the small number of American citizens that commit murder. And so this idea that, well, they're not committing as many as American citizens. Well, actually, if you adjust for population, they're committing a lot more. And that's the thing that unfortunately gets overlooked. You can't just look at raw numbers. You have to look at the rate and the likelihood of these things taking place. But furthermore, let's just say for the sake of argument, let's just say for the sake of argument that this were true. Let's say that we calculated out the, the murder rate and chips fall where they may just so happens that illegals are committing less murders than American citizens. Let's just say that happens. It's still not an argument for having open borders. It's still not an argument for not putting forth proper border security and making sure that people that are illegal immigrants are not getting into our country because any murder that takes place within our walls, within the borders of the United States of America, that are taking place by someone who is not supposed to be here is a failure on our part to secure our own borders. It is a failure on Congress's part and the federal government because Article 4, Section 4 says it is the federal government's responsibility to protect the states from invasion. And so when we have, for example, here in the state of Alabama, where uh, this horrible incident where an illegal immigrant actually raped a girl in Shelby County, the reason that people get so up in arms about that, because if you're being the victim of a crime, it really doesn't matter to you whether or not the guy's illegal or not. Like, you're still the victim of a crime. If you get raped, you get raped, and you don't really care whether the guy was an American citizen or not. And the same thing with murder, the same thing with robbery or mugging or whatever else it may be. So I understand it from that perspective. But the thing is, that means that we are allowing crime to be imported into our shores. That there are people that are not even supposed to be here, because at least if it happens with an American citizen, even though that's still a horrible thing and the victim doesn't feel any better that it happened to be an American citizen you're still dealing with somebody that you would kind of have to deal with anyway because human beings are evil. Human beings are a fallen race, and because of that, there's always going to be an aspect of wickedness in all of our societies, no matter how good they are. And there are going to be people that victimize and take advantage of those weaker than them. That is part of the human condition. The second oldest sin recorded in the Bible, because after the first sin with Adam and Eve, would be, of course, the murder of Abel by his brother Cain. So hatred and murder are parts of the human condition, as horrible as it is to think about that. It's the truth. But the difference is, when we're having people murder Americans that are not even supposed to be here in the first place, they would not have been afforded even the opportunity to take those people's lives if we had proper border security. And this is the reason people get up in arms about it, is because it is an easily preventable circumstance. You can't always prevent somebody 
for murdering somebody else. But if the person's not supposed to be in the legal, uh, supposed to be legally allowed into the country in the first place, and there is a failure on the federal government's part, and there certainly is to keep our border secure. That's the reason that people get up in arms about it. That's the reason that people get passionate about it, because they recognize that this is not something that we should have to deal with in the first place. And so that is the issue that you're running into. So Republicans on this government shutdown, in my opinion, they need to stay strong, stay calm, continue to look like the adults in the room, and let the liberals freak out that their precious federal government that they can't live without has been shut down for a couple of weeks and the world is still turning. That's really the method that we should be using here. That's the strategy that I would employ. Because the longer that happens, the longer it takes out, the more it looks like the Democrats are cutting off their nose to spite their face. And the numbers bear that out. The longer this thing goes on, the more people are blaming the Democrats, not Republicans. And part of the reason for that is Democrats and the Democrat base are the ones that get upset about the government being shut down. As a general rule, Republicans don't. We tend to be more self-sufficient, and so it doesn't affect us nearly as much. And so it's the Democrats' base that are going to be mad at the Democrats, and they're the ones that are going to eventually rise up and say, look, just give the man his stupid wall money so that we can open the, the government back up. Republicans are fine with leaving the government shut down for a while, and it's going to be okay. In fact, if you're the average person sitting out there, you've barely even noticed that the government is shut down if you haven't been watching the news. So for the vast majority of Americans, it isn't affecting your life, and if the Republicans can let this and continue to let it go on, it's only going to hurt the Democrats. And so eventually the Democrats will have to come to the table with something. I don't know if it'll be necessarily that $5.7 billion proposal, but eventually people are going to get to the point to where you're going to see those numbers. If they continue in the trend that they are, there's going to be more people blaming the Democrats for this than the president or the Republican Congress. And that day is swiftly approaching. If the Republicans will just show a little bit of patience, a little bit of maturity, then really the, I mean, the game is theirs. All they have to do is wait it out. There is an interesting case that I have a feeling is probably going to wind up before the Supreme Court unless there is another similar case that reaches the Supreme Court beforehand. And it really has to do with religious liberty, which, of course, you know, is something that is very near and dear to my heart. So there's a pair of Christian artists that are facing jail time for refusing to create art. Now, there have been arguments made in the past about the Masterpiece Cake Shop, for example, the big Supreme Court case where a Christian was essentially forced or at least compelled by the state association, an anti-discrimination law, to make a cake for a gay couple. And he argued, no, not going to do it. And so we're familiar with that case. We've heard a lot about them before. And so this guy wound up winning his case, but on very narrow margins. And one thing that the Supreme Court seemed to not bite on was the idea that a cake is a work of art, which a cake is absolutely a form of artistic expression. Baking in and of itself would be a form of artistic expression, but especially when you're talking about the icing and the decoration that goes into it, I don't see how any reasonable, logical person would not assume that crafting a cake, especially one as elaborate as a wedding cake is not art. I mean, it, as sorry as it is, even if you just draw somebody's name and icing on a cake, I mean, to me, that would qualify as art to a degree. But the reason this case is interesting, and I think that it really kind of takes away that argument, is nobody can argue that this is an art because it's called art. I mean, this is... What, what we're dealing with here is actually people that are artists in the, the more traditional sense and that they create works of art. And so there's really no rational way to make the argument. I would say that, that that also holds true for the cakes, but there's no product other than you're just observing it because it's pretty. And so because of that, there's, you can't eat it. You can't use it for other things like you could maybe with flowers or something else. And so this is something that it's only use is to be aesthetically pleasing. And because it's supposed to be aesthetically pleasing, then you really have nowhere else to run when it comes to the artistic argument. 
And this is a case about Joanna Duca and Brianna Koski. Uh, yeah, Koski, I think, is the way to say it. They own a place called Brush and Nib Studios in Arizona. And they're in Phoenix specifically, and this deals with Phoenix's law about anti-discrimination against people who identify as homosexual or trans or whatever else it may be. And so what they do is paintings, calligraphy, hand lettering, and one of the things that they've done for people before is they produce art for weddings. They produce them for the ceremony. They can use them as things like backdrops. They create logos because weirdly enough, everything's like a marketing thing now. And so even people's weddings have an official logo and they'll have uh, wedding invitations with a certain style of calligraphy, that kind of thing. And so because weddings, especially now, have become such a big production, artist for hire specifically for weddings is something that has become commonplace and they're no exception. And the penalty for them, according to this law in Phoenix, Arizona, to not make art for a gay couple seeking to have them do the calligraphy or the invitations for their wedding, something like that, would be $2,500 a day and or six months in prison. Not or six months in prison. You can get both. And so the penalty for this is absurdly high. I mean, we're talking about basically doing hard time. And you can see how $2,500 a day for refusing to create the art. So for, in other words, every day that you continue to refuse to make the art, you're stacking on more and more and more to where, I mean, after just two days, you owe $5,000 after four days, you owe 10,000. And I'm not going to go through all the math. That's you. You can do that in your head. I'm just saying that, Imagine that after just four days of sticking to your guns and saying, nope, my religion doesn't teach that. It teaches that it's wrong. I'm not going to help promote that using my talent and my skill and my artistic expression because I believe that it's morally wrong as a Christian. If you only do that for just four days, you're already at $10,000. That's insane. And so this is the problem that I have with this. This isn't Soviet Russia. This is not Mao's China. They can't take your property, your intellectual property, or, or your creativity and use it for their own purposes. That's not what we were based on. And keep in mind that this is not happening in New York City. This is not happening in Hollywood or L.A. or you know Oakland. This is happening in Arizona. Arizona is a red state, largely run by Republicans. The city, of course, isn't, and that's part of the reason that you have this anti-discrimination law in the city of Phoenix. But I'm saying that if it can happen there, you don't think it can happen in Montgomery, Alabama? You don't think it can happen in Birmingham or Mobile or Huntsville? If you think that, you're kidding yourself. If this could happen in Phoenix, Arizona, this could absolutely happen here. And so don't think that you're going to, to not be a part of this if this winds up coming our way, this could absolutely happen in a city very near us. And this case is being handled by the Alliance Defending Freedom, which the ADF, great organization, a lot of respect for them. They're the ones that have won so many Supreme Court cases specifically dealing with a religious liberty. They were the ones that represented the guy who ran the Masterpiece Cake Shop. And so really good, really no they know what they do. they are doing on this. And they have already appealed to the Arizona Supreme Court. So this is basically their argument. And this comes from directly from the ADF. Does Phoenix violate the Arizona Constitution's free speech clause when it forces commissioned artists to create custom artwork consisting of words and paintings conveying messages they object to? And when it bans commissioned artists from publishing statements explaining the artwork that they can and cannot create? So... At, at, as the SCOTUS ruled earlier this year in the California abortion clinic case, compelled speech is even worse than compelled silence. So as horrible as it is to silence somebody's voice and to say, no, you're not allowed to speak on this, they ruled in that case specifically, because you'll remember the abortion clinics, they were basically, by California law, obligating even a pregnancy, a crisis pregnancy clinic that doesn't believe in abortion, that they put up the clinic specifically because they don't believe in abortion and they wanted to help pregnant women with options other than abortion. They were saying, no, 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 you have to promote abortion 
at these clinics. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. That defeats the whole purpose of having the clinic. We're trying to help women find healthy ways to deal with this, not convince them that they need to abort the children growing inside them. And California law said, nope, you're not allowed to do that. And when they took it to the Supreme Court, they said, not only is it wrong to try to compel somebody to shut up and be silent, it is even more a violation of the First Amendment to compel somebody to speak a message that they do not agree with. And so I think that precedent applies right here, that if you are a homosexual couple and these ladies happen to be Christians and you walk into their shop and they say, no, no, you have to make an invitation saying that we're getting married. Well, I don't believe that marriage can occur between two men or two women. Doesn't matter. You have to say it. Well, then that is compelled speech. You are forcing somebody to not only support, but compel them to use their artistic expression to create a message that they themselves disagree with. It would be the same thing if, as if, I mean, in my opinion, I don't see the difference here. The, the, let's say the government came down on me and showed up in my radio studio one day and said, look, Caleb, sorry, we don't agree with your message. We think you're wrong on this. And so we've put up a script here. This is what you're going to say on the radio. And I look at it as like, yeah, this is supporting a, a, a hike in taxes. I don't believe in that. doesn't matter. We're the government. We're the law. You have to say this. You have to say that that is your opinion. That's exactly what is happening here it is a blatant violation of constitutional freedom. And as the ADF just pointed out, it is a violation of Arizona's own constitution that has a free speech clause included inside of it. So the ADF also doing some clever political maneuvering, they said, or legal maneuvering. They also said, does Phoenix's, uh, does Phoenix violate Arizona's free exercise of religion act when it, uses criminal penalties, including jail time, to force the commission artists to create and custom artwork expressing messages that violate their sincerely held religious beliefs, and when it bans religiously motivated speech. So this is a really smart move, because the Arizona law would prohibit you from speaking based on your religion if it violates their inclusion doctrine. I don't know exactly what it is. I haven't read the, the clause itself. Uh, America uh, Alliance Def Defending Freedom definitely has. But what they're saying here is that you're not only doing that, but this is what is so clever about the ADF and their strategy. See, what they're doing is they're playing local law against state law. They're not doing it on the national level. They're saying Arizona's law says this. And Phoenix's law is working in direct opposition to both their freedom of religion and their freedom of speech that comes not from the federal constitution. We're talking about rights that are talked about in Arizona's constitution. And so this is clever because they're going to have to go to Arizona's Supreme Court before they get anywhere near the Supreme Court and make this case. And so I think that it's a much stronger case that they are using Arizona's constitution and the things that are contained within its governing document as a foil to say that, sorry, Phoenix's law is violating that. And they're absolutely right. These two women's religious and speech is being violated. Their rights to have freedom of religion and freedom of speech are being trounced upon basically just for political correctness. And it's wrong, and unfortunately it's happening again, even though we've seen this play out so many times with Christians trying to, people trying to compel them to say and support things that they do not believe. See, this is an attack on our most basic rights, religion, expression, and association. There's four things there that really we should hold more sacredly than we do, but when it comes to religion, expression, and association, Unfortunately, we treat that as though it's no longer something that we ought to be concerned about. All right, so let's move along to the Daily Dose of Stupid. Now, you messed it up. <laughs> You're stupid. So today's Daily Dose of Stupid, I, I really love this one. It's always nice to be able to do a fun story. You need a little bit of background to understand this one. There is a dating app called Bumble where women have to make the first move. Not sure exactly why, not sure why it appeals to people, but that is the the motivation behind this dating app. So 
if you're a woman, you have to contact the man. He can contact you back once you do, but you have to make the initial uh, contact, I guess, is the way that they handle it. I've never been on it myself, so I'm just telling you what the, the report says. And this lady sees a guy. Apparently, she thinks he's cute or whatever, and so she gets in touch with him, and she contacts this guy on the app and brags about her latest kill. Now, this is not surprising, because if you're a girl that happens to be into some outdoorsy things, that makes you a rare commodity. That makes you somebody that is not real common when it comes to, because there's just not a lot of women out there that are into things like deer hunting. And because this woman presumably is, and she sees that as something that she wants to promote herself as, something that makes her alluring to guys, especially outdoorsy kind of guys, she brings this up pretty early on in their relationship on the dating app. And so what's really funny about this is in Oklahoma, it's no longer deer season for rifles. And maybe it is for bows. I'm really not sure. But the the guy actually asked her about the bow and she basically, uh, after a little bit of prodding, admits to having killed the deer that she's bragging about with a rifle. So your rifle season's already over in the state of Oklahoma and she's bragging about this with some guy that she doesn't know on a dating app. And based on her pictures, she was also hunting at night. And the reason that you're not allowed to hunt at night, for those of you who happen to not be hunters, is that it's easy to take advantage of the deer because you can spotlight. In other words, you can just kind of shine a bright light in their face. And then you can fire your, your weapon and kill them without having a whole lot of sport. It's pretty easy to take advantage of the game by doing that and it's it's unsporting and that's the reason that it's illegal in a lot of states and it's illegal in the state of uh, of Oklahoma as well. And so she's already admitted to hunting out of season and to hunting at night. And here's the problem. Turns out this guy that she's flirting with, yeah, he's a game warden. Even though he's a young guy, I think he's about 24 years old if I'm remembering the story correctly. Yeah, he's the uh, McIntosh County Game Warden, so the Game Warden for the county that she happens to be residing in. So he asks her for a picture, and she sends it to him. So she's actually actively sending this guy information and evidence against her, <laughs> not knowing that he's a Game Warden. And this guy wasn't expecting this. He wasn't looking for this at all. Like I said, the women have to make the initial contact anyway. So he couldn't have gone after this woman and, and pursued her with this particular app, even if he tried. But she keeps sending him incriminating evidence on herself. And he takes it and does a little research on social media, finds out who she is, shows up at her house, arrests her, and now she has pled guilty to hunting out of season and poaching. And uh, I don't know if she confessed to hunting at night, but there is strong reason to believe that that is what she was doing because of the way that the picture was taken. So I guess when she was looking for a date, a court date was not what she expected, but now that's what she's got. So guys, just be smart about things. You don't know who people are on the internet, uh, whether it's a dating site or Facebook with somebody that you don't actually know in person. You don't know everything about people on the internet. And when you're on the internet, you're in a public space. Be aware of that. Now, I'm glad that they wound up getting this girl because she was, you know, breaking the law. I'm just saying, as a general rule, for those of you out there that don't realize this, the Internet is not a private place. You access it from the privacy of your home, but you're in a public space when you do that. And so, <laughs> probably shouldn't be confessing to crimes <laughs> when you're out there on the Internet, especially with people that you don't know. So that's our, our dumb crook story for the day, I guess. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the chaplain's report. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of Daniel and chapter 2, 26 through 28. But before we get there, I do want to set the stage just a little bit. You have King Nebuchadnezzar 
who has asked for his dream to be interpreted. He's angry that none of the magicians or the Chaldeans can seem to do this. And so in his rage, he says, you know what? I'm just going to wipe out everybody. I'm going to kill all the ma magicians. And then Daniel and his friends, who happen to be wise men from Jerusalem, they say, uh, why, why is he doing this? And they have the situation explained to them. And so their reaction is, Daniel says, oh, I'll do it. I'll interpret his dream. And so they sort of pause on this initiative to kill all the wise men and the magicians so Daniel will have a chance to interpret the king's dream. And the David and his friends get together. They have a prayer meeting, essentially. They pray to God for Daniel to be able to interpret this man's dream. And then we had the other day that we find out that God does reveal the nature of of the king's dream, because not only does he not know the interpretation of the dream yet, he doesn't even know what the dream is about. The king has refused to tell anybody. And he says, if a person can tell me what I actually dreamed, then they will be able to correctly interpret it, which actually was kind of smart on Nebuchadnezzar's part, because otherwise people could just make up what the interpretation is and get it wrong. And so this way he knows that if somebody is telling him what his dream actually means, they do have some kind of supernatural ability. And since none of the pagans actually do and they don't have any connection to the true God, then they aren't able to do it. So he comes across Daniel and his friends and Daniel receives this vision at night. He praises God. He prays to him and thanks him for his wisdom, thanks him for his providence in this. And then we see finally it is time for Daniel to go before the king in Daniel 2 verses 26 through 28. The king said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered before the king and said, As for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days? This was your dream and the visions in your mind while you were in your bed. So a couple of things to unpack here that Daniel very quickly realizes what is going on. He wants Nebuchadnezzar to know what is going on too. And so he gives a commentary here. Now I want you to consider this because let's look at the context and what was going on. King Nebuchadnezzar has already promised great riches and rewards to anybody that can interpret his dream. He's saying, if you have the power to do it, then you will be greatly rewarded for your ability to do this. And Daniel does what, by the world standards, is the absolute stupidest thing you can do, again, by the world's wisdom, which is he walks in there and immediately tells the king, yeah, this power isn't mine. I'm not doing it. I'm not the one that's interpreting your dream. He goes in and he says, magicians cannot interpret dreams. Conjurers can't interpret dreams. Diviners, seers, whatever you want to call them. Humankind cannot interpret this dream for you. Only the God of heaven, which by the way, the Chaldeans actually sort of accidentally alluded to earlier, sort of in a, um, I guess what you would call an accidental prophecy by them. <laughs> Um, they're saying exactly what Daniel is saying here. He's saying, no man can tell you this. Only the God in heaven will be able to translate your dream. And so that shows for Daniel, who is still very much a young man at this point, we're thinking maybe teenage at the very most, maybe early twenties. So he's saying, wise men aren't going to help you. Conjurers aren't going to help you. Magicians aren't going to help you. There is one person that can help you. And that is the God of heaven. And that is who I'm going to tell you about tonight, right now. Man, not only does that take a fair bit of courage, but he's also essentially saying, power's not in me. That shows a great deal of humility on Daniel's part as well. Because he's foregoing and saying that he's willing to forego Nebuchadnezzar's rewards and his praise and everything. He's saying, this stuff isn't me. God's the one that told me this interpretation. I didn't do it. So if you want to thank somebody, thank him. If you want to give credit to somebody, give credit to him. And this is exactly the attitude that we as Christians should be having in our day-to-day -day lives. 
Whenever we do something good or right or we help out a neighbor or we do something great when it comes to charity work or we share the gospel with somebody and it turns their life around, we should say, look, it's, it's not us. I mean, I tell people that all the time. One of the lines that I use when people talk to me about my biblical knowledge, I'm like, look, it's not me. I just happened to read a book. That's not much of a testament to who I am. I'm not the guy who invented water. I just happen to know where a well is. That's all I am. And that's all Daniel is too. And he recognizes that and understands that. And he's telling King Nebuchadnezzar, if you want to have wisdom, he's saying this in a roundabout way, but if you want to know wisdom, if you want to know more about your dream and you want to know the true God of heaven, then this is the person that you need to seek out. You don't do it through me. You go to God. And so God is using me sort of as a conduit. I'm just God's tool, his messenger. I'm not anything special. Just because God happens to be using me to translate his message to you does not mean there's anything inherently special about me. If you want to give credit to somebody, give it to the Lord of heaven that gave me this ability. And so whatever gifts that we have, whether it's like me being a great speaker or other people that are great with kids or great with visiting people in hospitals, whatever gifts we have, let us remember to acknowledge that any ability that we have goes to our creator, goes to the God of heaven, just like Daniel witnessed here. And this is the same God that he talks about revealing mysteries and has shown Nebuchadnezzar. And so he's giving credit to God even for Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He's saying, God is showing you what is going to happen in the latter days, and you're going to be able to understand that because I'm here to help translate. And so on both sides, on both coming and going, it's all God's doing. It's all God's providence. God sent the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. God allowed the dream to be interpreted by Daniel, his prophet. And so God is the one in control of all things here. And so because of that, he's the one that deserves our gratitude. He's the one that deserves our praise. And when we as individuals are looking for somebody to give credit to, it needs to be to God. See, we as Christians, all we should be is mirrors. We can't produce light ourselves. When somebody is enlightened or made better by our influence, it's not because we're so great and we're so brilliant. It's because we are reflecting the greatness of God through us. That's what it means to be made in God's image. And that's what it means to be conformed to the image of his son, like it says in Romans. We are putting on Christ in love. And so when people see something great about us, it's not because they're seeing us. We're flawed human beings. What they are seeing is the mantle of Jesus Christ cloaked around us. And if we wear that mantle, we better be careful and understand that, that, is, that we are acting as a representative of the God of heaven just as Daniel was. But in doing so, we can greatly improve the status of someone else's life. And when we do that, all we need to do is point them back to God to give him the credit, him the glory, and help them understand that he is the one that can help them better their lives, not us. Stay the course, friends.